Okay, this morning we're going to do something a little bit different. Um, actually, it's not really different for us here because we're used to doing this. Um, on Thursday nights we have our Bible study and we do expository studies. We go verse by verse through um, entire books of the Bible. And uh, we've, I, what was the first book we started out with when we first started that? Um, Romans or Matthew. I think it was probably Romans that we did. And, uh, but we started at Romans and we went the whole way through all the Pauline epistles to Philemon. And then we went back, we did the book of Luke. And, I mean, read every single verse, commented on every verse. And now we've gone to the book of Acts. And after Acts, you know, I don't know what we're going to do after that. But a lot of people have asked over the years, what do we do on our Bible study night? You know, could you record one of your Bible studies so we could hear how to have just a regular Bible study? In other words, one that's just kind of ad lib. There's no prepared sermon or anything. We just go verse by verse. So that's actually what we're going to do this morning here, Sunday morning. Um, things are pretty busy right now for me. I didn't have time to really prepare a sermon, and I don't like to rush prepare for sermons because then I end up putting things down, and I, I just I like to be able to spend some time in the Word, spend some time in prayer when I put together a sermon. So I don't like to rush sermons. So this morning we're just going to record one of our Bible studies. Um, we're going to go through Acts chapter four. So if you are listening online, you can go in your Bible to Acts chapter 4. We're going to go verse by verse. And the way we do it is we start out, one of the men will read the entire chapter. Unless it's like a really huge chapter, then we'll split it in half. But Acts chapter, well the book of Acts a lot of times is just more historical than it is necessarily doctrinal. There's a lot of doctrine in it, but sometimes it's just explaining events. So you don't have to comment a whole lot on that. So what we're going to do this morning is we're going to have Brother Jesse come up and read Acts chapter 4, and then I'll come back and we'll go through it verse by verse. So if you want to come up and read it. You want me to read out of your Bible? That doesn't matter. I have it there. You can. Okay. I don't have the... I don't have anything to stand on this week, so I can barely see over this thing. Yeah. For you folks who don't know what I'm talking about, Brian's a little taller than me, and he made a nice a nice uh, pulpit here to mm-hmm. preach from, and my head barely clears it. I had a, a stool the other time I was preaching so I could actually see folks. But that's okay. I can read the Bible here. All right. Acts chapter 4. I'm going to read down all the way to the end. And as they spake unto the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came unto them, being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in hold unto the next day, for it was now even tied. Howbeit, many of them which heard the word believed, and the number of the men was about five thousand. And it came to pass on the morrow that their rulers and elders and scribes and Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and as many as were of the kindred of the high priest were gathered together at Jerusalem. And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, By what power or by what name have ye done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, If we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man, by what means he is made whole, be it known unto you all, and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which is become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled, and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. And beholding the man which was healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. 
But when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves, saying, What shall we do to these men? For that indeed for that indeed a notable miracle hath been done by them is manifest to all them that dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But that it spread no further among the people, let us straightly threaten them that they speak henceforth to no man in this name. And they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye, for we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding nothing how they might punish them because of the people. For all men glorified God for that which was done. For the man was about forty years old on whom this miracle of healing was showed. And being let go, they went to their own company and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said unto them. And when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, thou art God, which hast made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is, who by the mouth of thy servant David has said, Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? The kings of the earth stood up and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For of a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles, and the people of Israel were gathered together. For to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings, and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word. By stretching forth thine hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul, Neither said any of them that aught of the things which he possessed was his own, and they had all things common. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Neither was there any among them that lacked, for as many as were possessors of lands or houses sold them, and brought the prices, or the, yeah, the prices of the things that were sold and laid them down at the apostles' feet. And distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. And Joseph, who by the apostles was surnamed Barnabas, which is, being interpreted, the son of consolation, a Levite, and of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it, and brought the money, and laid it at the apostles' feet. Turn this back for you, Brian. Okay, now we're going to go back through it, <clears throat> and uh, the way we do it here is that if anybody has any comments or things as we're going through or a question on a verse, just go ahead and fire away. A lot of times, too, what I'll do is I'll ask a question, and I want participation from all of you out there. Of course, if you're listening online, you're going to have a hard time participating, but, you know, you can be with us in spirit. Okay, and... uh So let's begin here. Acts chapter 4, verse 1. And as they spake unto the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them. Now what were the three groups there? The priests, the captain of the temple, which is kind of weird to have a captain of a temple. Kind of strange. And then the third group is who? The Sadducees. We're going to see here in just a minute about that. Look at verse 2 being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. Now, why is that significant? Well, keep your hand there at Acts chapter 4 and just turn back to Acts chapter 23. 
you're going to see the significance there of why they were so upset about preaching Peter uh, there preaching the resurrection. Acts chapter 23. Here you have Paul basically being on trial. And Acts chapter 23 verse 8. It says here, For the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, neither angel nor spirit, but the Pharisees confess both. And if you read the context of the chapter there, chapter 23, we're not going to for sake of time, but Paul actually used that weird system that they had, that weird system of belief, to cause division between the Sadducees and the Pharisees. Because the Pharisees believe in the resurrection, the Sadducees don't. Okay? <clears throat> Very interesting. So you can see why there, in chapter 4, if you go back there, chapter 4, verse 2, they were upset about uh, them preaching the resurrection from the dead. Verse 3, And they laid hands on them and put them in hold unto the next day, for it was now eventide. Kind of interesting when you have a church that has power to put people in prison. You say, well, we're very far away from that. We have religious freedom here in America. Uh, maybe at one point in time, but that is quickly changing. Uh, verse 4, Howbeit, even though they put them in prison, howbeit, many of them which heard the word believed, and the number of the men was about 5,000. And as we heard earlier there, while, while Brother Jesse was reading through the, the chapter, it says about that these, these they didn't want to do, they couldn't do a whole lot to them because they feared the people. So you, you got these two guys here, Peter and John, basically on trial, and outside are 5,000 men that believed what they were preaching. So guess what happens if you're a, the high priest and the Sadducees and the captain of the temple, and you do something to these guys? you got 5,000 people to answer to. Men to answer to. You know, there might have been even more women, you know. I don't know. That's a lot of people. Verse 5, And it came to pass on the morrow that their rulers and elders and scribes and Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and as many as were of the kindred of the high priest were gathered together at Jerusalem. So they, they waited till the whole big crew of big shots was there. And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, now look at this, this is so important here, by what power or by what name have ye done this? You know, we've gotten that here at Bible Believers Fellowship. What right do you have to preach? Are you ordained? What college did you graduate from? Have you gone through the government to get permission to preach? You know, that's why the First Amendment was created here in America. Because King George over in England was trying to say only licensed, ordained clergy could preach here in America. And if you would stand up and preach the Word of God out in public like a street preacher... You'd be whipped and flogged for that because you're not an official or ordained clergyman. Do you know that that teaching does not appear in Scripture? Yeah, there were some, they, they would ordain men for a certain purpose and they'd put, lay their hands on him and pray for him and stuff. That's fine. I don't have a problem with that. But when you start having that combination <clears throat> of state and church and they start saying, are you licensed? Do you have our permission to do what God tells you to do? You've got a dangerous system there. You've got a very dangerous system. And by the way, Romans 13 does apply that you're supposed to be submissive to governmental powers, but the two powers that are given is for punishment of evildoers and war, essentially. If you have foreign people trying to come in and attack your country, you should have military power to keep foreigners out. You know, our founding fathers there again did not want foreign intervention wars. But we also are supposed to have the the uh, the sword is given to the government. That's their purpose. And when they start getting into other things like health and education and the church, you got a tyrannical government. And you'll see that, and we can't cover it all today, but you'll see that if you read through the book of Acts, there are times when the Lord is breaking the disciples, the apostles, he's breaking them out of prison. He doesn't say, well, now you have to go through the legal system there, you know, and you have to, you know, work through the system. Get a good lawyer, 
you know, and declare your rights. Uh-uh. He's like, I'm going to come in here. Okay, go on back out and preach. You know, something else. So when somebody comes along to you, if you're doing the work of the Lord, and they say, by what power or by what authority are you doing this? You know the spirit that it is. It's the spirit of organized religion. We're going to see that as we continue here. I could go off on that subject all day. Verse 8, Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them. Now I want you to notice that too. It doesn't say then Peter, filled with knowledge and understanding and education and everything. He was filled with the Holy Ghost. That's all you really need as a Christian. If you are filled with the Holy Ghost, the Lord will speak through you. And speak. you'll speak according to the Word of God. According to written scripture, but isn't it interesting that the people that the most of society would have considered to be the religious leaders, it doesn't ever say that they spoke by the power of the Holy Ghost. And you know there are a lot of people that get through seminary and they're out there, they're ordained, they're licensed, they have all the credentials and stuff, they have big churches, and they don't speak by the power of the Holy Ghost. When they speak, when they preach. It has not, there's no connection to Scripture other than just a few misapplied verses. See? So, you're not supposed to have you know, high degrees and all this other stuff. That's, that's the things that organized religion has. You're supposed to speak by the power of the Holy Ghost. Just incredible. <clears throat> Verse 8. Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel... If we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man, by what means he is made whole, be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. They did not magnify themselves. They magnified Jesus Christ. And notice he did not say, now, we're all sinners, and we all cause Jesus to be put to death. And, and if we all believe, and we, 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 he said, ye crucified. He pointed his finger right at them and said, you were the ones. It wasn't up to us. I mean, you read back in the Gospels, they didn't want him to be crucified. Jesus actually rebuked Peter because Peter said, far be it from me. He said, I don't want you to be crucified. But it was the rulers of the people that turned the people against Jesus Christ. So Peter is speaking the truth and he's saying, you were the ones that crucified him. And you go back through the book of Acts there, Acts chapter 3, you'll see it numerous times when he's preaching. And he says, ye crucified, whom ye hanged on a tree. Ye crucified him. You know? See, when you preach to the lost world, you need to be direct. You need to break, get them to a point where they're broken as sinners before the Lord. You know, as one guy said, I, I forget who it was anymore, but the guy said, a man can't be fixed until he's broken. Yeah. You can't get saved until you're a sinner. Right? And that's the problem with the modern church. They're not preaching against sin. They're just preaching believe. And you say, well, why? Well, because Jesus loves you. And he wants you to go to heaven. You're not going to find that in Scripture. It's a very different thing. Verse 11. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Who's supposed to be the head of the church? Jesus Christ. Not the Pope. Not the vicar. Not the uh, <clears throat> archbishop or the, you know, whoever. No. The head of the church is supposed to be Jesus Christ. But organized religion, they can't stand that. Because, see, Jesus Christ, He'll put all men on an equal plane a lot of times. You know? He'll use unlearned commercial fishermen to preach the word. See, that's, that doesn't look good in society's eyes. You get some guy who's highly trained and highly respected and all this other stuff, like the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They want to be up ruling the people. Notice it said the rulers of the people came together. They were the ones that were judging Peter and John here. It's amazing. But that was a prophecy that Jesus Christ gave, and Peter is there again repeating it. Now look at verse 12. Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. 
Well, I think that uh, all paths lead to God. All There are many roads to salvation. God's not going to send someone to hell because they're religious. Or, uh-huh. You have somebody start preaching that and they start preaching anybody else but Jesus Christ, you're dealing with a false prophet. You say, well, there, are there any exceptions to that rule? Nope, none. Jesus Christ said, John chapter 14, 6. Anybody want to quote it? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Exactly. Jesus Christ Himself said, there's no other way to heaven except through Me. Okay, Don't ever fall for somebody. And, and I'll tell you something else too. We were talking about this last night. We were going through it. you know. And this, this whole modern Christian movement, they're starting to drop the name Jesus. They'll say, I believe in Christ. I believe in Christ and, 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 and Christ is my Savior and Christ, Christ, Christ. And a lot of them are even dropping the name of Christ too. But you know, I think you ought to say the name Jesus. If you want the full title, it's Lord Jesus Christ. And it's very dangerous when you start having people talk about Christ. We're going to see that too in just another minute or two here. Verse 13. Now when they, the religious leaders, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived, look at this, this is beautiful, that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. Hmm. Isn't that interesting? Unlearned and ignorant men. Do you know that that's what you're going to be considered if you are a King James Bible believing Christian today? And it's funny because there are men that are on our side that have five or six earned degrees. And they are still considered unlearned and ignorant if they stand for the King James Bible as a final authority. It's incredible. I mean, you can go through, you can go through the seminaries. You can learn Greek and Hebrew. You can be, you know, you can write dictionaries. And you're still considered unlearned and ignorant. <clears throat> Just incredible. But that's who the Lord will use. You can read 1 Corinthians chapter 1. You can see who the Lord will use. He doesn't often choose the wise and the mighty. He confounds the wise. Of the wisdom of this world. Excuse me. Verse 14. And beholding the man which was healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. That's a problem for them. But when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves, saying, What shall we do to these men? For that indeed a notable miracle hath been done by them is manifest to all them that dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. There's 5,000 guys out there that saw this thing happen. They've seen the proof. We can't possibly cover this up. What on earth are we going to do? You know? They're probably wishing they could have gotten there first, you know, and kind of stopped it from blowing out of proportion, but that wasn't the Lord's will. Verse 17 but that it spread no further among the people, let us straightly threaten them. Oh boy. <clears throat> that they speak henceforth to no man in this name. And they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. <laughs> By our holy decree, we command you that you may no longer speak or preach without a license or 501c3 incorporation. You know, <laughs> I mean, that's the kind of stuff you're going to get. You know, and, and I've had people say, you know, you're a heretic, you're, you're for preaching this King James only stuff and this whatever. And whatever. I had some, some guy the one time say, you know, he's like saying I was a heretic for teaching dispensationalism and stuff. And, and he said, oh, I found out that you're a Baptist as well. And I'm like, okay, first of all, I'm not, I don't call myself a Baptist. Doctrinally, yeah, I probably would be closest to the Baptist denomination. We're not really denominational here, but whatever. But and he's like, "You are, you sir, are a heretic." That's what he said to me. "You sir, are a heretic." <laughs> and it's just like these religious. And he was some like, I forget what he was, Episcopalian or some kind of like priest or something like that. You know, and it's like, but but uh, you know, he he did pass his decree on me, and you know, I'm supposed to like fade into the background or something now. It's absurd. See, that's what organized religion does. And when organized religion can get political power so they can start to imprison their enemies, they won't hesitate for a second. 
And the bloodiest killers in history are your religious leaders, like the Catholics. Read Revelation chapter 17. She's made drunken with the blood of the martyrs and saints of Jesus. Okay? Watch out when government and religion start to combine. Watch out. And we're getting worse and worse and worse with that, not only in America, but also in the UK. I know that a lot of brethren over there, and they're saying the same things. And of course, it's prophetically there in Scripture, so you're going to see it. Say, can't we do anything to stop it? Well, we can do some things to delay it, but we can't stop it. Prophecy is pre-recorded history. Don't ever forget that. Amen. Continuing here. <clears throat> Verse 19, But Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye. In other words, in your own little warped minds that you make up your own decision there. Okay, you guys judge whether that or whatever. But here's what we're going to do. Verse 20, For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. They saw Jesus Christ after the resurrection and He Open the Scriptures to them and preach to them. Now, Jesus said back there, we, can't, we are not going to go to the verse, but He actually said to them about blessed are ye because ye have seen and heard Me. But it's more of a blessing for those that have not seen and yet believed. We have a greater blessing than they did back then. Now, can you imagine what it would be like to all of a sudden we're here like the, they had in the upper room and all of a sudden, there's Jesus Christ standing there, physically present. And he says, I want you guys to go out and preach up in, uh, down in Hopeland this afternoon. You know, yes, sir. <laughs> we wouldn't be like, well, I really kind of wanted to take a nap this afternoon. I mean, <sighs> no, no. We would be probably pretty zealous if the Lord appeared to us physically. It's kind of sad that we're not zealous when he doesn't appear physically. Mm. You know, that's why we have such kick ourselves there. Eh? That's why we have such grace and mercy. Yeah. Praise the Lord for that. Yeah, praise the Lord for grace, exactly. But and that's mercy. Not an, not an alibi to sin. Yeah. It's not an alibi to sin. That's right. <clears throat> but they had seen and heard from Jesus Christ. That's why they were so zealous. Verse 21. So when they had further threatened them, they gave them a couple more. They let them go, finding nothing how they might punish them because of the people. For all men glorified God for that which was done. Did you know that the organized religion people, even though they are powerful and rich and everything else, they still fear the people? And they won't do things that, that will be, make them unpopular? Mm -hmm. They gauge what is what the people want to hear. And then they'll tell them that. That's how they make their money. <clears throat> Verse 22. For the man was above 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing was showed. Can you imagine that? 40 years old. And if you read over in Acts chapter 3, uh, verse 2, And a certain man lame from his mother's womb was carried and then laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them and that entered into the temple. This guy never knew what it was like to walk. You know, we have a couple little babies here, you know, in, in our fellowship here. And, you know, the one he walks fine, the I, I'm not gonna mention names and stuff, but you know, the our little girl here in our fellowship, she's just starting to walk. But can you imagine being a little baby and you get older and you never walk? And all your life you can't get up and walk to the bathroom. You can't get up and walk out to get something to eat. You have to be carried your whole life. Forty years. And it says above 40 years old. Huh. And that's something. And just like that, you can walk. And leap. Yeah. Well, the leaping came after the walking. And I'm sure, you know, it was like <laughs> quite a happy thing. I mean, I prayed for 36 years. I'll be 37 in less than a month. I prayed for that long to get married, you know, and the Lord answered my prayer. Amen. But how about a man that couldn't even walk that entire time? Talk about a new lease on life. <laughs> Be incredible. Continuing on, verse 23. 
And being let go, they went to their own company and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said unto them. <laughs> you know, isn't that interesting? Because we do the same thing today. You know, we'll get this email or some kind of letter or some, some nasty thing where we'll be like, you got to hear this. <laughs> I'm going to read the email. you got to hear it. It's exciting. When you're persecuted for righteousness sake, when you get a bunch of religious hypocrites coming after you and, you know, threatening you with their holy powers and all this, it's like, you got to hear it. This is great. See, you know, years and years ago when I was a modern Christian, I would actually read the Bible and I would see that there was really not a whole lot of my religious beliefs and things that I could compare with people in the Bible. And I came under very great conviction of that, and I thought to myself, I really don't have much in common with these people. But boys, I started to become a Bible believer, and I started to study, and I started to get into ministry. Now all of a sudden it's like, hmm, there's a lot of the Bible I can relate to. And let me just encourage you, if you're out there and you're new to the King James issue, and you're, and you're just starting to listen to the sermons here and things, as time goes by, you're, there's going to be more and more that you're going to be able to relate to. And you're going to find great comfort in the Scriptures because you're going to see, as the Bible says, you are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. There are people in the Bible that you're going to read and you're going to go, man, that's exactly what I'm going through. This is identical. It's the same thing. And let me just give you a little bit of a, a rebuke if you're out there and you say, and you are where I used to be, where you read the Bible and you say, I really can't relate to this. I get along fine with everybody. I'm not really being persecuted. You better examine your life. You better change some of your beliefs because, it, you know, Christianity has not really changed. The attitude of the world is still the same. In fact, it's worse now than I, I believe in the in the first century. You know, so you better just uh, examine yourselves according to the scriptures. But anyhow, verse twenty-four. And when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, Thou art God, which hast made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is. They lifted up their voice with, to God with one accord. These people were in agreement. They weren't uh, saved and lost, coming together to fellowship in some big place that they call a temple or a church. Very important to remember that. Look at verse 25. Who by the mouth of thy servant David hast said, Why did the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? The kings of the earth stood up and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against His Christ. I'll get back to that in a second. What is being quoted there? Psalm 2. Yep. Psalm 2 verses 1 and 2. Exactly. That's what's being quoted there. Alright. So they are quoting Scripture. Lifting up their voice to God in one accord, they're in agreement, and they are quoting Scripture. Oh, you're a bunch of Bible thumpers, you know. Oh, yeah, yep, that's what we're supposed to be. I know yeah. for myself that, uh, and I'm glad the second psalm was mentioned, but some some folks, when they give glory to the Lord or pray in the morning or something like that or during the day, they know what to say. I have no idea what to say sometimes, and I find that if I go and read one of the Psalms, uh, David can just speak for me. It's almost like the Lord speaking to the Lord, but just the right things are said to give praise to God mm -hmm. just by reading His Word. And I, I find that's often a big help to me because you know, I'm, I'm funny that way. When, when it comes to giving the Lord praise and getting the words just right, I, I can't do it. So God's Word can do it for me, and there's a good example of it right there. Exactly. Yeah. And it's interesting too because I actually heard the one time that there are some Jews that will actually sing the Psalms, you know, kind of like it's almost like a hymn book for them, you know, and I, mean, I wish I knew how to do that. I don't really, but uh, it's just interesting. I mean, yeah, exactly. There's a lot of Psalms that just really cover what you're going through and, and uh, when you're praising God, He wants to be praised with His Word, you know, definitely, and, and or in accordance with His Word. But notice it says there in verse 26, and against His Christ, the Lord and His Christ. 
That's what I mentioned earlier. Watch out for this movement to remove the name Jesus or Lord Jesus and just to have Christ. See, there are two Christs. The Lord and His Christ. And then there's the Antichrist, which is coming very soon. And I'm going to tell you right now, most modern Christians are already worshiping the Antichrist. The Christ that they worship, He just hasn't appeared yet. You know, the Christ that they worship, you study Him, and it's the Antichrist. He comes to bring world peace. He doesn't judge anybody. He accepts everybody. He's this effeminate guy that's just so nice and sweet. And, you know, they're worshiping the Antichrist. So watch out for the thing. It's just people just using Christ. Christ just means anointed one. Is basically what that means. It's, it's like a Greek form of the word Messiah, which is a Hebrew word. All right? Watch out for that. Verse 27. For of a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together. For to do, now look at this, all these people gathered against Jesus Christ. Verse 28, For to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. Isn't that interesting? You know, I did a sermon a while back on the 2012 elections, who's going to win? You know, and I told you who's going to win. And I'll tell you again who's going to win. The very worst person. Whoever the worst man is for the job, that's who the Lord's going to put in. Why? Because righteousness exalteth the nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. America is in sin. God cannot bless a nation like this. And God has before determined who is going to be put in. God's not up there, you know, holding up a Ron Paul sign or something, you know. He knows who's going to be in it. Ron Paul's out of the picture now anyhow. You know, because of his son, you know, backstabbing him, among other things. But we're not going to get into that. But the whole point is, God knows who's going to win. Okay? There's no question in his mind. And it's going to be the one that can correct the American people the best. Okay. Verse 29. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings, the religious leaders, and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word by stretching forth thine hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child, Jesus. There's the J word again. You know? Is that the verse that has changed the servant? The yeah. A lot of the new versions won't say holy child, Jesus. They'll say holy servant. Jesus. Okay? They take Jesus down to our level. Humanize the Lord. Okay? But notice there, it says, uh, Now, Lord, behold their threatenings, and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word. You know, we might be threatened here very soon. I mean, the threats are already coming. They're just, you know, getting worse and worse. You have more and more churches that are siding with the sodomite agenda. You know, didn't you say LCBC is going to be marrying two queers or something like that? You know, I mean, it's these big churches are going to go that direction. They're going to be okay with sodomy, and these religious leaders and the government leaders are going to start saying, "How dare you preach against sodomy? You're going to be put in prison." You know, and we're going to have to pray to the Lord for boldness in that time period. Grant us boldness so we can preach Thy word. I don't know how long the internet's going to be around. And we talk about that a lot. You know, if the internet gets taken down, I believe our fellowship is just going to become a local ministry here. You're not going to be listening to us anymore. And for you out there that are listening, whatever country you're in, whatever state you're in, wherever you're at, you're going to have to pray for God to give you boldness to preach the Word of God. Okay? It could get real rough. All right? You say, well, then I better conform and go into hiding. You know, I'll go to a modern church and just kind of fit in. Don't do that. You know, it's interesting because I had a, a brother write, and, a, and I'm getting behind in my emails. I've got to write back to a lot of people. But he said, why are so many Bible-believing Christians quitting on the Lord? Well, because they see the enemy troops coming, and they're standing in line, you know, and the Lord's saying, hold your ground, hold your ground. And they're like, retreat, retreat. And they, and they run. And they go join the enemy. There's a lot of Christians that are doing that. And it's funny because they say, well, I didn't want to suffer. Suffering is where you need to get as a Christian. 
And I don't mean making yourself suffer. You just stand for the Lord and the suffering comes. And when you suffer, you will reign with the Lord. That's the point that you need to get to. And it's like you get right to that point. These Bible-believing Christians get right to the point where they start to suffer. They start having family and friends make fun of them. I had a sister write and she had to drop out of a ministry because they were using new versions. You know? And it's just like right when you get to the point, and she's not dropping out, I'm not saying that, but a lot of Christians, when they get to that point, they get like, i got to quit. And it's like, right there, you're right there where the Lord can start using you and blessing you and rewarding you in heaven. And right at the point when people start to get blessed by God with the suffering, getting all the goodies, you know, <laughs> that's when they run. Turn tail and run. Watch out for that. Okay, verse 31. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Huh? What? What? Where? What? It doesn't say that. And they spake the word of God with boldness. God grant us boldness to speak His Word. Okay? That's very important. Verse 32, And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. Neither said any of them that aught of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. Okay, now a lot of the brethren will use this to spin off onto a big rant against communism and for capitalism. Well, you're basically using man-made systems. And you're assuming that communism is always corrupt and capitalism is always good. Not so. Capitalism can also become very corrupt. When you have people that are, you know, I, I can't think of the word I'm looking for right now, but when capitalism gets to a point where it starts to monopolize things, you know. Fascism. No, not fascism. It's... I, I can't think of it right now, but when capitalism gets to a point, what do you have here? Well, democracy, yeah. Yeah, democracy. But there's a, there's a specific type of capitalism that I'm thinking of. And I can't... It's just not coming to me at this point. But basically, it's, it's when you have kind of an oligarchy where capitalism is competition, but you start to eliminate capitalism. Or when you start to eliminate... Corporate fascism? Yeah, it's, it's, that's a good description of it, yeah. Maybe it'll come for you. Maybe. But, you know, a lot of the brethren will say, well, you shouldn't do this communism thing, this communal type living as Christians where everything is common. And I agree with that. Okay, these guys, you got to keep in mind dispensationally what's going on here. They're expecting that they're still in that time period where the nation of Israel could have accepted Jesus as their Messiah. Jesus could have come back soon. They're expecting the soon return of the Lord and the Millennial Kingdom is what they're expecting. And because of their actions, they ended up being poor saints at Jerusalem. The Macedonian Christians had to send things with Paul or whomever to give to him because they still they were in the, the Kingdom of Heaven mode, like yeah. you're saying. Yep. Yeah. Later on you see that, that the, the, they actually were very poor at Jerusalem as a result of what they were doing earlier on there. Yeah. Now, I don't believe that you ought to have ridiculous amounts of land and houses and all kinds of things like that, you know, you can because your priorities are kind of messed up. You know, to get lands and houses, you have to work very, very hard, put in a lot of hours. Okay, the Bible says that you are to provide for your own, you are to work. If any man doesn't work, he's not to eat. That stuff is there for a Christian. Okay? But you should not seek to be super, super rich. I want to be a millionaire. Eh, your priority's a little, little bit off there. And there is a thing there that he that had gathered much had... Um, yeah, look that verse up. It's in 1 Corinthians 9, I think, or 2 Second Corinthians, Second Corinthians 9. But um, <clears throat> there is still a thing there for Christians where if you have an abundance, you should give to somebody that has need. And if somebody has need, they should be... Their, you know, your abundance should be a supply for their lack. What's the... Um, you find it? Okay. We'll go on to the next verse here while you're looking for that. 
verse 33, And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. And by the way, let me just say that. Notice the power was upon them, and they did testify, they witnessed to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, but without God's grace being upon them, they could have done nothing. God's grace has to be upon you, or you'll not get any work done. All right? What is God's grace? Well, it's giving you something that you don't deserve, essentially. And none of us really deserve to be witnesses of Jesus Christ because all of us have sin in our lives. But when the Lord overlooks that and says, I remember the sins of your past, you know, I see them there, but um, the blood of Jesus Christ has cleansed those sins, and I'm going to do mighty things through you. I mean, look at Peter, the Apostle Peter, all the things that he did in his past, and yet the Lord used him to win thousands of people to the Lord. Pretty incredible. Verse 34, Neither was there any among them that lacked, for as many as were possessors of lands or houses, sold them and brought the prices of the things that were sold, and laid them down at the apostles' feet, and distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. So they were very, very, very zealous there, getting a lot of the work out. And you say, well, was it a sin then, that what they were doing? No, I don't believe that. Because I believe that at the beginning there, it was very important for them to get out there and really spread the gospel out. So I do believe that the Lord used this, what they were doing. But then later on, the other saints had to you know, be a supply for their lack, basically. So, you know, it'd be very similar to today, like we had this mass thing here. We just said, well, let's just sell this and let's sell that. You know, I'll sell my pickup truck and, and a couple thousand dollars that I'll get for it. Uh... I'll buy tracks with that. We'll buy 20,000 tracks and just go put them out places and stuff like that. You know, well, I'll sell, I have a boat, you know, I'll sell that. Well, I have five acres in the mountains, I'll sell that. And we'll buy 10,000 Bibles, 10,000 King James Bibles and just send them to some place or do whatever. That's what they were doing. Did you find the verse? I think I actually have two for you. Second uh, Corinthians 8.14 but by an equality that now at this time your abundance may be a supply for their want, and their abundance also may be a supply for your want, that mm -hmm. there may be equality. As it is written, he that had, had gathered much had nothing over, and he, he that had, had gathered little had no lack. Is that what you were looking for? Yep. And the, the other one is over here, uh, 1 Timothy 6, uh, 9. But they that will, not shall be rich, but... They that will be rich, so that's their desire, but, but they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. And of course, First Timothy 6.10, that they change in all the new versions. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith, which means this is talking to believers, mm -hmm. and pierce themselves through with many sorrows. Yep. So wanting to have lots of money and stuff, that's not good for a Christian. Yeah. And the other thing too you were you were saying, it's not so bad when you when you have this kind of communal thing a little bit when it's not government owned and operated. Mm -hmm. When it's the Lord giving you the desire to sell something you own for the better of, of the body of Christ. That's a whole different story than this than this government <coughs> socialism where they steal your money through taxation and give it to people who don't do anything. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, this isn't a welfare system here that's being taught. Right. This is believers selling what they had to give to those that had need. You know, I don't think it was just pure socialism like right. you know, I need I need uh, groceries or something like that. No. I think it was to further the work of the Lord. Because you see that there, they were getting out there and doing many mighty works. Verse 36. And Joseph, who by the apostles was surnamed Barnabas, which is being interpreted the son of consolation, a Levite and of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Okay. <clears throat> and I'm sure it was probably gold and silver. <laughs> you know... <coughs> And of course, you know, Barnabas shows up later on in the book of Acts. He goes on to, to be with Paul and they do many mighty things together. And uh, so that's Acts chapter 4. Anybody have any other comments or thoughts on it before we close? Well, there in verse 36, you know, 
uh, Barnabas was a Levite, but at this particular point in time where we went from being under the law and you had your your Aaronic priests, your Levitical priesthood, that wasn't really happening anymore. So although Barnabas became a you know a great man of God later on and he was uh, was able to minister to people, though he was a Levite that didn't mean much anymore. I think mm-hmm. that might be one of the reasons why God put that in there, verse 36, to show you what he thought about Levites. Yeah, yeah. that's a good point. Yeah. You know, because now we are all the priesthood. Under grace, you yeah. Know. Priesthood of the believer. Yep. Yeah, priesthood of the believer. Yeah, good point. Definitely there. And, uh, of course, you go on to chapter 5 then, which we'll be doing Thursday night. And that's where it comes into the thing of... Uh, Verse 38, uh, where you have Gamaliel standing up and he says, And now I say unto you, refrain from these men and let them alone. For if this counsel or this work be of men, it will come to naught. But if he, if it be of God, ye cannot overthrow it, lest haply ye be found even to fight against God. And that's, that's kind of, that verse ties in very well with chapter 4. Because you have this whole thing of the two different classes. You have organized religion on the left hand. And then you have true born-again believers on the right hand. And the guys on the left hand, the organized religion, are saying we have to stop this. And let me just give you a little bit of encouragement. Organized religion is never going to be able to completely stamp out Bible-believing Christians. It's not possible. Why? Because if it be of God, you cannot overthrow it. Lest happily you be found even to fight against God. Organized religion will never, ever be able to destroy true Bible-believing Christianity. Why? We have the God of the universe behind us. They have the God of this world behind them. And because God said so. <clears throat> and because God said so in the King James yeah, Bible. You know, the Greek or the Hebrew too, I'm sure he said it, but uh, they're kind of useless today to the modern Christian. And modern by English speaking, I mean. Not modern apostate. So anyhow, that's Acts chapter 4. So we'll close here with a word of prayer. <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, I thank You for Your Word. Uh, thank You for the reminder in there that, that we don't have to submit ourselves to organized religion. We do not have to be accepted in the sight of the world. We do not have to be government approved to do Your work. Uh, your Holy Spirit can lead us. Your Holy Ghost can lead us into the truth. And all we really need is Your Word. And if we're English speaking, we need your King James Bible that you uh, put out there, Lord, and, and you inspired and has just as much power as the original autographs. And Lord, if there are any out there that, that don't quite understand that or that this argument, the whole Bible version issue, then I pray that you would direct them to our other website, kingjamesvideoministries.com, and they can watch hundreds of videos there and, and read and they would really study the issue and realize that there are two different Bibles. And uh, we're so thankful, Lord, that you have given us the wisdom and the understanding to know your true word, the King James Bible, and that we can lift up our voices with one accord. It's so neat to, to get emails and, and letters from people in all over the world that are going through the exact same things that we're going through right here in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. What an amazing thing. That we can have fellowship not only with believers all over the world, but also with believers down through the centuries. Going back to the first century, we can relate. If we could go on a time machine, Lord, back to the first century, we'd be right in with this group. And what a blessing, Lord. What a blessing to be able to be part of the body of Christ and to know that we are part of the body of Christ because of the way the world treats us. Because it's the way the world treated you. So, Lord, I just pray that you would grant unto your servants boldness and courage as the dark days are getting darker and as more and more persecution comes upon thy church I pray Lord for courage and strength and, uh, and I can't say that there won't be any fear Lord because it is fearful but I pray that we would overcome those fears and that we would put our trust in thee and in thy word and preach it and teach it until you take us out of here and so I just pray all of these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. And now, what we typically do is we close with a little bit of a hymn.
and then we have time of fellowship. So that's what we do here. Um, if you want to start your own Bible study um, out there, it's there's really not a whole lot to it. You can just kind of get together with some friends and and just go through the Bible, read the Bible, and just the Lord will speak to you through His Word. And you and you might not be great at it. You might not be able to go off on as many rabbit trails as I can, <laughs> you know. But the Lord will show you things. Even if you just want to read the Word of God, it might get to a point where believers are going to have to totally stay away from any organized churches, including independent fundamental Baptist churches. It's getting rough out there. And if you have to find yourself in a position where you can't go anyplace without compromising, where they force sodomy to be preached from the pulpits that it's okay, and we're getting there, if that comes to, to a point like that, then meet together with other believers. And if you can't meet together with other believers, then just meet by yourself. You might have to do that a little bit. I'm not going to deceive you and say, God's going to do a powerful work in this country. God's going to do a powerful work, but it's in the negative. we got some rough times coming. Okay, You can study the Word of God through an expository type of style where you just go through, as believers, you go through and you say, what do you think the Lord means here? And, you, and you'll be amazed at how the Lord can speak to you through His Word. So that's going to be it for this morning. Thank you so much for listening. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. If these sermons or videos have been a blessing to you, please help us to continue this work by supporting this ministry. You can donate online through PayPal at our website, www.kingjamesvideoministries.com. Thank you, and may the Lord Jesus Christ bless you.